Um, I wanted to think a little bit about uh, thinking strategically about geospatial and thinking strategically about uh, open source geospatial in particular, green open source geospatial in particular. I've been, always been a big fan of Phosphor G. I, um, my first one was in, in 2007, Victoria. Um, and uh, I've actually used a ton of open source code even before that when I was back in the UK 15 years ago when I actually, um, when I actually uh, sort of did some work for Macaulay Land Use Research Institute and such. So we used to always write a lot of our own code. Um, and this is sort of a, uh, an extension of that. What, I, what I've always been really envious of in people is when they seem to really know what they're doing. Um, when they seem to have this sort of deep sense of intent around what they're doing. And I, it, I struggled for a while in trying to determine what that, what that really meant. But um, for me, uh, thinking about that intent started me to uh, consider what, um, what it would be to, to work within a strategy, which is when you really know how you approach a problem. And in many situations, the strategy is like an unfair advantage because you already know how you're going to do something, <clears throat> excuse me, before you even approach the problem. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, some tools around strategy, and then we're going to talk about uh, how we can apply that to uh, the geospatial world that we live in um, right now. Okay, so tools on strategy. Let me get my thing going here. Okay, this is, this is what my, uh, my description was. And this is not to say that you shouldn't do things that are fun. This is just to say that you should, uh, that if we think about what we are doing in a more uh, strategic manner, then the things that we're doing that might just be in air quotes fun could also be something a lot bigger than that. And we can wrap it up and focus it in to something that is um, that's perhaps deeper and, and, and perhaps going to be more pervasive and be more persistent and attract a larger community, which is going to mean that is a more successful open source project. So we're not going to talk about Sun Tzu or War and Peace here. We're going to get into some strategic generalities, however, because I think that's kind of important. Um, first off, I'm sorry not to be doing this this year. This is from Phosphor G uh, last year at San Diego, Phosphor North America last year, San Diego. Um, but I do applaud um, uh, Phosphor G UK for, for running this. I think it's been a tremendous success. I'm super excited. I've seen, um, I've seen just lots of excitement on the internet about this. So I think it was exactly the right thing to do. Um, two thumbs up. Well done. Okay. Strategy. We are going to do something with a purpose. We're going to know why we're doing it. Think about strategy as in a North Star. You, you know, always know which way you're pointing, you know exactly what you're going to be doing. However, just because you're following a North Star doesn't mean you're not going to deviate around lakes and trees and mountains. You need to think about a deviation. You need to think about uh, an appropriate route to execute on your strategy. So these are important things to be thinking about. It's a useful thing to have in day-to-day -day life because it just removes a chunk of decision-making. Um, if you already know how you're going to approach a problem, you don't need to consider how you're going to approach that problem. It's already taken care of. So you have this sort of intrinsic raison d'etre, you have this intrinsic knowledge of how you approach a particular problem. You might already have a strategy. It might simply be, I just use open source to use spatial gravity. I'm not even going to think about it. And that's a good one. But it's going to be a little bit more um, nuanced, one would expect, over time as you start digging more into strategic thinking for your business, to thinking for your career, strategic thinking for your personal life. You're going you're gonna to add some nuance to, to, to those things. And that's a, that's, a, that's a piece of discovery. And that's when we start thinking about the difference between what might be a strategy, what might be a tactic. A lot of people say, I'm going to use this strategy for that thing. And you think, well, actually, what you're talking about is uh, a tactic that you're using to execute a different strategy that you perhaps haven't written down somewhere. Um, and the strategy will also have scale to an organization. So what might be strategic um, at, a, at a lower level might be tactical at an upper level. So think about that. Um, scale is important, um, and different scales will imply different um, levels of potential execution as we as you roll forward. 
And let's look at that in a little bit sort of a more deep um, description here. We've got organization A, organization B, organization A uses, is a cloud company. They just always use cloud as their strategy. They, they won't even consider anything else. Organization B is going to use a cloud for a particular project. And you can see how you have different, different kinds of evidence and different kinds of outcomes. Ultimately, conceivably, externally, they might be looking like they're doing the same thing. But the way they go about that same thing is actually very different. And as a result, organization A, which is completely committed to this way of thinking, will execute in a much more performant manner. They'll, go, they'll be much faster and they'll be much more, um, uh, they'll have a, a, a much higher level of expertise in the, in the deployment of whatever they're doing. Now, it's worth noting here that if we suddenly apply this to uh, an open source strategy, a lot of the evidence and a lot of the outcomes are the same. So applying a strategy actually gives you a lot of advantage it's just straight off. Um, you have the expertise in, in your strategy, in your, in your how, in your approach. Uh, you don't need to discuss a bunch of things. You don't need to, you, you have this deep level of comfort in the approach that you're taking to a project. This means that a lot of that busy work up front where you're, you're discussing how you're going to do something, you're discussing whys and where for alls, you're trying to get executive buy-in, all that kind of nonsense, all that career risk associated with the first open source project, all that stuff just goes away. Um, and you get to focus deeply on how you perform in your, in your duties. And I think that's a really interesting thing for us as a community to consider. You're always going to have to do your proof of concept, your experimentation. But as soon as you can spin that into an actual strategy, then you're off to the races. That's when the real benefits, the real sort of business benefits of, of a particular approach um, sort of come to life. But like I said before, you, you still need to be thinking about what you're doing. You need to be thinking about why you're doing that. And then you need to think about, well, was that actually the best way and did it work? These are, this is what, what I think of as a spin cycle. It's just a feedback loop, fancy picture. It's just a feedback loop. We know what this is. But the important thing is, just because you've decided that this is the direction you're going in, doesn't mean it's always the right direction. This is an important thing to think about in terms of, um, in terms of reflecting and in terms of ensuring that you're, um, following through with the spirit of the strategy that you that you assigned. So you're never actually going to, as an FYI, never going to reach your North Star because um, it's an approach. If you, I, if you develop a strategy and you reach it, you've probably just written a goal, not a strategy. It's a different thing. However, it's worth using this concept of reflection to consider uh, velocity versus speed. Speed in business is kind of a useless metric because more often than not, you're going slightly the wrong direction. However, if you, if you start using velocity as a metric, you're, you're gonna be doing a much more effective job for whatever you're trying to achieve. So what are we doing? Why are we doing that? You have these big, these big curves that are taking you off your, your track to the North Star, but you're, you're, you're okay because you're reflecting as you go and you're pulling it in. So always be thinking about velocity and whenever someone says, yeah, yeah, we're going so fast, we're a fast company. Well, that's great, um, but, but which direction are you moving in? Because without direction, speed is virtually useless. Um, okay, now we've, th that was the first part of the talk where we talked a little bit about some strategic tools and how to get yourself into the mindset. Now I wanna start thinking more overtly about where we are in our industry. So what is, modern geospatial we're at this i think we're at this this pivotal turning point um and if we avoid things like religious debates about technology and if we avoid things about um you know defining what it is that we do for a living and you start thinking about what it is that people actually want uh to achieve in terms of location or digital technology digital geography or whatever it is that gets us to a really interesting place so if open geospatial is the best way, 
then the arguments for open, open geospatial technology should be strong. And, and in fact, they are very strong. Do they preclude proprietary technology? I don't think they do. I think proprietary technology will have a place, but you also always need a counterpoint and you also will, uh, you'll, you'll need some other tooling which will, which will become important as well. So open geospatial, I think is a deep philosophy. Um, if you have that in mind and you take that to the market, the problem is we don't, we're in a position where we need to persuade other people that that the philosophy is important and they don't really care about our philosophy so it just needs to be a solid business reason people need to be sold on a better product or need to be sold on a better experience or need to be provided with something that is incrementally better than the alternative so we can't sell a philosophy we can't and i mean by by sell i mean uh whether it be to your executive or whether it be to a consumer, or whether it be to some kind of B2B, whatever it is. It's hard to sell a philosophy, but it's easier to sell performance. So with that in mind, I think the power of open source is community and accounting. In terms of uh, accounting, like, what do I mean? I don't mean money necessarily. I mean the idea that uh, every time you write a line of proprietary code, uh, you you write a liability for your organization. But every time you write a line of open source code, you write an investment for your organization or your community. And that's an important differentiator. Um, and, and it also applies to open data products like OpenStreetMap. Um, uh, if, if you create a feature, it can be managed by the community. If you create a feature and you own the map, well, you just created another liability that you have to maintain over time. That is um, That is a, a deep differentiator um, in the philosophy that other people might not necessarily be thinking deeply about, but is very important. Um, open source is also more resilient for the consumer because you have a community surrounding it, the creator can leverage that community, but also um, a consumer of the technology is protected uh, by the community. The technology is not going to go away because a company failed one year. The technology is going to persist because the community will not fail. Um, and that is an important piece. However, we are at this place, I think, in, in the evolution of geospatial, where we need to take deep care of some of our projects. GDAL needs uh, funding. Um, Spark Geo, we put in a bunch of money into GDAL Barn, but GDAL Barn is kind of a one-off. We need to be thinking more deeply about funding infrastructural projects, which uh, of which we all stand on, on, on their giant shoulders. So I think that's, that, that's a point that we need to deeply consider. Um, I ripped off Rennie McGree. This is not a cloud. It, it's, from the, it, it's from the picture, you might recognize it. I can't see anyone's faces, so I don't know if you got it. Anyway, this is not a, this is not a cloud. There is no geospatial cloud. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to, to, to think about. So without ro robust, on-demand pricing, um, there is, it's not really a cloud product. So I don't see on the market any tuned geospatial cloud. There are numerous examples of tuned clouds for the finance sector or for uh, IoT or for health these days. There's lots of tuned clouds, there's no geospatial cloud. And I think that's really interesting. It might be a pricing problem, it might be a scalability problem. It might be any number of problems, but I haven't seen one that's on the market right now. Here's a really interesting story. Um, so I started this business and I quite often, and, and I live in Canada, Western Canada, I quite often go south. When I was allowed to uh, get on the airplane across the border, I could go south, I would go to uh, San Francisco, it's typically where the money is, and uh, talk, to, talk to companies about geospatial. And, and I'd say, you know what? To be fair, there's a couple of proprietary options you could consider and they say, no, 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 Will, we absolutely want to go with the open source stack. We want to own all the IP that we write on top of that. Fair enough. That's, that's how they go. So we've written a ton of code um, based on open source technology that is being used within the startup community in San Francisco. So that's a really interesting model because as soon as that code gets written, it gets uh, deployed in a proprietary cloud. And I think, I think that's really interesting. 
So with that in mind, there is probably a product out there whereby a startup would feel comfortable using a data, you know, a, a geospatially focused data product that is, that is um, highly scalable on demand. Um, and I think that's really interesting. So that's a gap. Um, and it's a gap that we don't see very easily unless you're overtly operating in those markets. We don't see them, I think, because, <clears throat> excuse me, geospatial people are really good at building geospatial things for other geospatial people. And this is a really important uh, diagram. Um, I, think it's, I think it's out of scale because I think the geospatial people bubble should be smaller and the people bubble should be much bigger. And it's important for us to remember uh, there's many, 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 many more people who are not geospatial people than, um, than otherwise. So if we're building products for the consumer, we should be thinking about what <clears throat> other people might get value from. So if we pivot that a little, little bit. So I, I tried to make this picture so it like tilted down, but I, I don't know, maybe you get it, maybe you don't. Uh, perspective matters. So when you, you think about red oceans and blue oceans, red oceans, are they're, they're, the, they're like for this highly competitive environments, well understood business models, hard to access markets, hard to get in there. So if you're going to build, um, if you're going to build a web mapping product, that's a pretty tough place to be. But if you're going to build a geospatial product for everybody else, then that's really interesting because no one else is using geospatial right now other than the geospatial community. So if you can leverage geospatial, and then pipe it into an environment where other people can understand that tech, then you're into a really good space because they simply aren't leveraging geospatial right now at all. Um, so blue ocean, almost empty of competition. Additionally, in our case, the blue ocean is potentially much larger than the red. There are many more non-geospatial people than there are geospatial people. Thus, there's more opportunity there. Um, Five minutes. Oh, five minutes? Perfect. Okay. Uh, here's, my, here's my last example. I, 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 was, I was lucky enough to go to a trade mission to the UK immediately before COVID. And um, <clears throat> in doing so, I heard a lot of nomenclature around upstream geospatial or upstream something or other. I think this is like this minor obsession with, um, with oil and gas. But nevertheless, it actually rings true. So if you have this upstream company that's creating data, could be a remote sensing company, could be a cell phone data company, could be any of those kind of guys. And, um, and the thing about geospatial is we have, this, we have this obsession with saying, well, we can sell this to any market. We can sell to anybody. Well, that's great, except that you don't know how to sell it to anybody, let alone everybody. Um, because everyone's got a different market. Here I'm using colors to describe kind of market segments to some extent. If you're, if you're selling it to everybody, that becomes super difficult. And turns out for a lot of geospatial products, people actually don't want the product that you're selling. They want a derivative. So no one wants a uh, fire hose of imagery. That's, that's actually really annoying to deal with. As a GIS person, um, a new image every day is a new problem to resolve every single day. That's a lot of problems. However, if you uh, engage with a series of partners, then suddenly the upstream geospatial guys can only deal with um, a limited number of market verticals. And those people can know their own markets deeply and build the appropriate derivative products. So I think what we're going to see in the, in the very near future is this morphing of how remote sensing um, and upstream geospatial companies um, have, to, have to think strategically about building partnerships instead of just selling imagery to everybody. There was a time when you could sell an image, typically to the defense sector or typically to the environment or government sectors, because those guys had the resources to do something with it. If you're going to sell an image into the commercial sector, you need to be able to sell, in fact, a derivative product, something that's already got some features extracted. Potentially, you've already created the metric or the chart or the histogram or whatever it is of that product. So maybe you've actually created an oil demand index, or maybe you've created a crop price, or maybe you've created retail performance based on car counting or something of that nature. Um, in which case, the upstream guys can sell to the downstream guys, the downstream guys can sell out to their customers, 
um, and provide a, a royalty back. It's a much, much simpler model. Um, I think I'm going to call it there before I get too far on. Um, there's more stuff here. Um, feel free to jump in there. Feel free to um, comment. Uh, feel free to uh, challenge what we are saying as part of you and, and um, hold us to account on our on our opinions. Um, we're trying to be vocal on the internet, but um, but you know you may hear, you may not. We're on a different side of the ocean. Um, so there we are. Brilliant. Thank you, Will. That was really really good. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Miguel. So it's, he asks. Are Mapbox and Carto not a geospatial cloud? Um, I think they've got parts of it. I, yeah, I, I would argue that they have parts of it. I don't think they have the whole shebang. Um, I really liked Carto when it had the, um, it, was, it was like an easy front end for Postgres for a long time. And I found that just yeah. really compelling. And I find that, I thought that was an awesome thing. Um, I think they focus very much more business analytics because it's a bigger market. And I think that's reasonable. Uh, Mapbox has gone down um, the automotive market, but I think they're kind of, uh, that was great, but they're also focusing a little bit more on their, on their web mapping piece. Their Atlas product is kind of interesting for on-prem. Um, I think there's a lot of really good stuff there, but although there isn't like a Amazon console for, um, for Mapbox yet. And I think that's, that's kind of the piece that's missing here is that you can, you can pull up a console and you could push all your data to it. And then suddenly, you know, maybe it's a map, maybe it's a chart. I, I, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be overtly geospatial, deeply geospatial from, um, from the get go. And I, so, so yes, I think they've got a better pricing model, which would support on demand, uh, which is close, but no, I don't think they're quite there yet. Okay. And I suppose um, that sort of links into the question about what specifically do you mean by a tuned geospatial cloud? What, what is the, the tuning that is required in order for you to be happy that someone has attained that? Um, I think, it's so you could argue that you can run PostGIS inside RDS on Amazon and, and you could call that a geospatial cloud. You could argue that, but I think yeah. that it's a bit disingenuous to the a to the to the postage project, and it's a bit disingenuous to, um, and, and it's a bit of a stretch um, because it's not, um, it, it doesn't have all the pieces there. You're still going to be pulling in other other bits of technology. There's no there's there's no overt mapping piece to that. Um, okay. There's no you're, you're still pulling in a, another piece of technology to make it all happen. And I although in most kind of web app land, you still have that. I still think that because you're pulling in various different threads, it's not necessarily as out of the box as you would expect. Okay, yeah. And in terms of what you were talking about in terms of uh, strategic thinking, is there a size of project or a size of organization that dictates whether or not there's success in such thinking? No, I, I, I've seen individuals I've been, I've been deeply envious of because they seem to just know what they're doing straight away. And I think, wow, that, that person, they might not know it, but they're, but they're operating in a strategic manner. They just, so, uh, you know, it, it can be from an individual who's just decided that this is the way I'm going to run my lifestyle business all the way up to, you know, a massive organization. I mean, what we saw the, the UK geospatial strategy yesterday. I think that's a great thing. Um, I'm not, sh yeah, I, 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 I it, it, it doesn't seem like terribly succinct, but it's focused on making data more available and, and you know, supporting the geospatial sector uh, and seeing it as an intrinsic piece of, of um, sort of governmental policy. I think that's, that's a, good, a good start. So, yeah, from individuals up to nations, I, I still think there's a, there's a value in thinking strategically about, about how you want to um, run um, certain parts of, of your business or life. Okay, cool. And uh, there's a question here from Howard Butler, which I think is both pertinent and incredibly important. How does the community financially support infrastructure like GDAL in a sustainable way? I, uh, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> I see, I, you know what, I, I, I thought the, 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 the GDAL barn thing was important. It was really good, uh, good step forward, but boy, it's a one-off. 
And uh, it, it, we, we need that to happen every year uh, in reality. I mean, Jidal, we all stand on the shoulders of giants um, and, and we, uh, we absolutely need those projects. Um, Jidal, many of the OSGO projects, frankly, to be, to be funded in, a, in a, a much more robust manner than they are. Uh, there are a, a, a few people upon whose shoulders we, we absolutely are, are standing. So putting our money where our mouths are is one piece. Maybe the Geospatial Commission in the UK has a, has a, a part to play in the funding of some of those projects. And I'm not just pointing fingers at the UK by any means. I think uh, if there was a similar entity in Canada, if there was a similar entity in the US, they should also be, be feeding into those environments too. Uh, knowing that much of, uh, much of the geospatial architecture in, in, um, across the globe is, is, is fundamentally pinned to, to the success of GEDO. Yeah. Approach four and such, yeah. I'm afraid we've run out of time um, again, which is, it's really cool that we're getting these questions in that can take us right up to the end of our session. So um, I just want to ask all of the attendees to show their appreciation for Will and the talk that he just gave, either by clapping into the video or, or pressing your reactions button. Be great. Thanks, Will. Thanks very much, everybody.